Hi there, this is part four of the fluids and electrolytes under the chronicle of medical surgical nursing. So for this clip, we will be talking about magnesium imbalances as well as different dietary modifications or diet for the patients with specific diseases or disorders. So to start, let's begin with magnesium introduction. So when I say magnesium, remember, okay, magnesium, the normal magnesium level in the blood ranges from 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. Again, it's 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. Other book, it's 1.8 to 2.7. Now, things to remember. When I say magnesium, please do not forget the relationship of magnesium and impulse transmission. Take note, magnesium and impulse transmission are inversely proportional. In short, when magnesium in the blood decreases, impulse transmission increases. And of course, the other way around. If magnesium in the blood increases, impulse transmission decreases. Again, impulse and magnesium are inversely proportional. And another thing, magnesium is the drug of choice for an obstetrical problem called PIH, or pregnancy-induced hypertension, or also called toxemia of pregnancy. I hope you can still remember the concept of preeclampsia, eclampsia. So again, the main reason why we give magnesium to patients with PIH is to prevent seizures or convulsions. Now let's discuss the different magnesium imbalances. Let's try to divide this into two sides, hyper and hypomagnesemia. Now, on the left side, it will be hypermagnesemia. On the right side, it will be hypomagnesemia. Again, impulse transmission inversely proportional. So that is why if patient has hypermagnesemia or an increased magnesium in the blood, expect that there will be a decrease in your impulse transmission. Am I right? And if there is a decreased magnesium level in the blood, there will be an increase in your impulse transmission. Again, these two are inversely proportional. Let's start with your hypomagnesemia. Reminder, if there is a decrease in the magnesium level, impulse transmission increases, am I right? That is why, as a complication, patient will have seizures or convulsions. Another thing, because of an increase in the impulse transmission, this will eventually cause ventricular dysrhythmia or ventricular abnormal rhythm. So again, it causes ventricular, ventricular dysrhythmia. Now, reminder, we have several ventricular dysrhythmias. Am I right? Now, these two are common ventricular dysrhythmias that may occur to patients with hypomagnesemia. First ventricular dysrhythmia is your ventricular tachycardia or your VTAP. Ventricular tachycardia or your VTAP. And the second common ventricular dysrhythmia is a polymorphic type of ventricular tachycardia. And what is the polymorphic type of ventricular tachycardia? Answer, your torsa de poids. Again, it is sure. It is your torsa de poids. So take note, these are common ventricular dysrhythmias that may occur to patients with hypomagnesemia. Let's proceed to its management. Because of a decrease in the magnesium level, we know that the management will always be you give the missing one. Am I right? So since it is a form of deficiency or hyposecretion or a decrease in the level, the management is magnesium supplement. Am I right? So the management here is you have to give magnesium supplement to patient. And common is what we call your magnesium, magnesium sulfate. Thing to remember in your examination. Now, before you give magnesium to your patient or before giving magnesium sulfate to patient, okay, you need to check the following parameters. And what are this? You have to check drop. You have to check drop. What does drop stand for? Drop stands for D. Check for what? D, deep tendon reflex. Take note. An absent or diminished deep tendon reflex is an indication of magnesium toxicity or hypermagnesemia. Take note, magnesium toxicity and hypermagnesemia, they're the same. Take note, D, deep tendon reflex. R stands for respiration. So you have to check the respiratory rate of the patient because a depression in the respiration or depressed RR, depression would also mean magnesium toxicity. 
or hyper, magnesemia. Another is letter O. You have to check for what? You have to check the urine output of the patient because oliguria is an indication of toxicity or hypermagnesemia. And last letter, P, P stands for pressure. You have to check the blood pressure of the patient because hypotension, a decrease in the blood pressure, which is also an indication of hypermagnesemia. So again, before giving magnesium supplement to your patient, you have to check DROP or your drop. Don't forget, check deep tendon reflex, respiration, oliguria, urinary output, and P, pressure. Please not forget this. Now, among the presentations DROP, what do you think is the earliest presentation of magnesium toxicity? Answer, deep tendon reflex that is diminished or absent. So take note, diminished or absent deep tendon reflex is an early indication of magnesium toxicity. That is why, please do not forget this. Okay, patient with magnesium toxicity, presentation will be your drop. And among the ROP, it is your deep tendon reflex said to be the earliest presentation of hypermagnesemia or magso toxicity. So the question here, what do you think is the treatment or management for patient with magnesium toxicity? Pretty, okay, I am pretty sure that you know the antidote, right? Okay, I can hear that. No, I can, I can hear that. Patient with magso toxicity, the antidote is actually your calcium solution, okay? Your cal Shum solution. In the market, we have a lot of calcium preparations, right? It can be calcium gluconate. It can be calcium gluceptate. It can be calcium chloride. But among the type of solutions or calcium preparations I mentioned, it is your calcium gluconate said to be the most common type of calcium solution given to patient with magnesium toxicity. Okay, clear? I hope so. Now, with respect to your magnesium, I need to, okay, I need to emphasize something Okay, about renal failure and magnesium level. Okay, please allow me to erase the board. Now, I hope you are familiar with a condition called renal failure. Remember, a patient with renal failure, the excretory function of the kidney is actually affected. Now, what type? There will be a decrease in your expiratory function. Am I right? So, a patient with renal failure, there will be a decrease in your excretory, excretory function. Am I right? In short, the ability of the kidneys to get rid of too much water, the ability of the kidneys to get rid of too much electrolytes, the ability of the kidneys to get rid of waste products, they are all affected to the point that since the excretory function is depleted or affected, waste products in the body, the water, what else, electrolytes will accumulate. Am I right? So expected that a patient with renal failure will have hyperkalemia. Am I right? So a patient with renal failure will also have what? Will have, of course, hyperphosphatemia. Correct? Now remember, in the previous video clips when we talk about phosphate, the relationship of phosphate and calcium, again, they're what? Inversely proportional. In short, if there is an increase in the phosphate, complication will be hypocalcemia. So please do not forget this. Patient with renal failure will have hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, and what else? Patient with renal failure, since the ability of the kidneys to get rid of waste products and even hydrogen is affected. So what will happen? Hydrogen ions will retain. Hydrogen, hydrogen will accumulate inside the body, increasing its concentration. That is why if there's too much hydrogen in the body, it decreases the pH. And a decrease in the pH is what we call acidosis. Now, what type of acidosis is present to patient with renal failure? Answer, metabolic acidosis. Again, why did the patient with renal failure develop metabolic acidosis? Answer, due to hydrogen retention. Why did hydrogen retain? Because the ability of the kidneys to get rid of excretory function, to get rid of hydrogen is affected. So that results to hydrogen retention. Again, when hydrogen in the body retains, hydrogen concentration increases. If there's too much hydrogen, the pH falls, resulting to acidosis. Again, what type of acidosis? It would be your metabolic acidosis. And of course, last, patient with renal failure, since excretory function is affected, there will be 
hypermagnesemia. So again, let's try to recap. Patient with renal failure, they have hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, metabolic acidosis, and hypermagnesemia. Now take note. If a patient with renal failure develops hepatic ulcer disease, there is a need for us to give antacid. Am I right? Now, there is a specific antacid ideal only for renal failure. And there are also certain antacids that cannot be given to patients with renal failure. Take note. I hope you can still remember the different antacids. Now, again, antacids, these are actually agents that will neutralize acidity, right? Now, what are common antacids that you know? Let's start. Number one is what we call your amphogel. Am I right? Another type of antacid is what we call your milk of magnesia. Am I right? And another type of antacid, I know this is very common, and that is what we call your malox. Let's try to identify the different, of course, uh, generic names of this K antacids. Generic name of your amphogel is what we call your aluminum high drug side. Generic name of your milk of magnesia will be magnesium high drug side. Now what about malox? Reminder, malox, if you combine, if you combine amphogel and milk of magnesia, that becomes your malox. Okay? So malox is a combination of aluminum hydroxide plus magnesium hydroxide. So you try to analyze. If patient with renal failure exhibits hypermagnesemia, can we give milk of magnesia? No, because milk of magnesia contains magnesium. Therefore, milk of magnesia is contraindicated for patient with renal failure. Now, what about malox? Malox is a combination of amphogel and a combination of milk of magnesia. Again, it contains magnesium. Again, malox is contraindicated. That is why. What is the best antacid given to patient with renal failure? Answer, amphogel. Can you follow? I hope you learned something. Okay? So please do not forget this concept. So a patient with renal failure, when you give antacid, do not give milk of magnesia, do not give malox. Instead, you give amphogel. Clear? I hope so. So let's proceed to another concept, the different dietary modifications of the patient. Allow me to get clear, clear the board. So this time, we will be talking about the different dietary modifications and, of course, with respect to the different diseases or illness of the patient. So for, for, for this portion, I'll be talking about carbohydrates, we'll be talking about protein, and we'll be talking about fats. So who among patients are ideal to have high-carb diet or low-carb diet or high-protein or low-protein or high-fat, low-fat diet? Okay, so let's start with your carbohydrates. Okay, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are actually sugar, right? These are actually sugar. And I said, and I hope you can still remember in your biochemistry, that when you mix sugar and oxygen, that gives you ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Am I right? So when you say high carbohydrate or high sugar or high carb, who among patients are ideal for a high carbohydrate diet? Well, for a high carbohydrate diet, patient K okay, with hepatitis. Am I right? As I said, hepatitis, patient having kidney problem will have high carbohydrate diet. Now, what about high protein? High protein is indicated to him. Remember, proteins are building blocks. Am I right? So when you say building blocks, this is, this is actually essential for healing. This is actually important for repair. So who among patients are or need to have Patients need to have a high-protein diet. Well, those who are post-op, all right? Post-patient with burn injury. Patient who had trauma, am I right? Why? They, they need protein for healing or for repair. What else? Patient with COPD, am I right? And please do not forget this. Patient having nephrotic syndrome. So again, please do not forget this. When you say nephrotic syndrome, patient need to have patient needs to have high protein. Remember technique nephrotic, frotic, protein, 
protein diet. Therefore, nephrotic PK, nephrotic syndrome, patient with nephrotic problem, nephrotic syndrome, they need to have a high protein diet. Okay? Now, what about for high fat? Remember, fats are also important, right? High, high fat diet. Now, who are those patients? Okay, who among are at okay, who among needs who among needs high fat intake? Well, those who are taking what? Vitamin ADEC. Why? Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, these are all fat soluble vitamins. Am I right? So you need to have fat in order for this A, D, E, K, K to be absorbed. That is why you have to increase fat intake of the patient. Okay? So please do not forget this. Now, what about the other way around? So what about for patient, okay, when is low-carb diet indicated? Well, low-carb diet is indicated to patient with COPD. Remember, it's sugar. Therefore, low-carb diet is also indicated for patient with diabetes mellitus. Am I right? What else? For those who are obese, and remember, one complication of what we call gastric surgery, dumping syndrome. You know dumping syndrome? I hope you can still remember dump, dumping syndrome. Well, dumping syndrome refers to rapid passing of food into your jejunum or into your small intestine without proper mixing or digestion. You call it your dumping syndrome. Next, now what about low protein? When is low protein indicated? Low protein is indicated to patient with renal problem or to patient with liver problem or hepatic problem. Liver problem or to patient with hepatic problem. Why? Remember, remember, protein, okay, the byproduct of protein is actually ammonia. Am I right? Ammonia is toxic. That is why the liver needs to convert that into a less toxic form. Or shall I say, in a lesser evil. So ammonia enters the liver, and the liver converts ammonia to become urea. The question: Who eliminates urea? Urea, okay, is actually eliminated by the kidneys. Can you follow? When you void, when you urinate, it contains urea. Therefore, if a patient is having liver problem, hepatic dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy. Okay? If you have liver problem, the ability of the liver not to convert ammonia to become urea is impaired. Therefore, ammonia in the blood increases. Am I right? Now, what about for patient with kidney problem or renal problem? If you have renal problem or kidney problem, urea cannot be eliminated. That is why blood urea nitrogen increases in the body. Again, common sense will tell us first If, sorry, hold on. Sorry. Again, common sense will tell us nurses that if in the body, ammonia level increases, it means to say there is a problem with the liver. But if in the body, urea increases, there is a problem with the kidneys. Therefore, if ammonia, urea, liver, kidneys, take note of the scenario, these two substances are derived from protein. That is why Patient with liver problem, patient with renal problem, the diet must be low protein diet. Because if you increase protein intake of a patient with liver problem, the more ammonia increases. If you increase protein intake of a patient with a renal problem, the more it increases BUN or blood urea nitrogen. Can you follow? So that is why renal and liver problem, they need to have low protein diet. Aside from renal problem and liver problem, what are other conditions that require low protein intake? Well, you have nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome. So don't forget this. Nephrotic high protein. Nephritic low protein intake. Can you follow? Now, what about low fat? When is low fat indicated? Well, low fat is indicated to patient with coronary artery diseases, right? Example of CAD, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, angina pectoris, myocardial infarction, right? What else? Low fat diet is indicated to patient who are, of course, hypertensive, am I right? Or to patient with increased lipid in the blood or patient having lipidemia or hyperlipidemia. 
What else? Low-fat diet is also indicated to patient with pancreatic problem. Okay? Pancreatic problem, just, just like your pancreatitis. Can you follow? And of course, patient having renal failure. They need to have low fat because a patient with renal failure because of the disease process. Okay, it's part of the disease process of renal failure is okay, the, the, the blood cholesterol level increases. So you don't want to augment or worsen the condition. So you have to decrease fat intake of the patient. Can you follow? So these are things you need to remember when you talk about dietary modifications. Okay? So you have your high protein, low protein, high carb, low carb, high fat, and low fat diet. Now what about for specific dietary restriction or dietary modifications? Allow me to clear the board first. Let's start with bland diet. Now, when I say bland diet, your bland diet is actually a non-spicy. In short, it is not. Uh, it, 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 decrease, it, it is a diet that decreases irritation in the GIT. Can you follow? So when you say bland diet, this is ideal for patient with upper GI problem. Can you follow? So when you say a bland diet, what will you avoid? So if you have bland diet, you need to avoid cash. So what, what do you mean avoid cash? So you need to avoid coffee you need to avoid alcohol you need to avoid spicy foods and you need to avoid hot foods can you follow so when you say bland diet it is a non-spicy okay a diet that decreases irritation okay and a diet case okay, that that is not hot can you follow and take note, the main reason why bland diet must be observed or must be followed is that this type of diet promotes healing of the gastrointestinal tract, specifically in the upper GI. Now, what about for lower GI? Okay, For lower GI, it must be what? Low fiber diet. Low fiber diet. Can you follow? So when you say low fiber, another term for low fiber is what they call uh, low residue diet. Can you follow? So again, low residue or low fiber, they're the same. So when I say low residue or low fiber, this is indicated or best for patient with lower GI disturbances. So when I say low fiber, take note, what you need to remember here, BRAT diet. So this is what we call your BRAT diet. So B stands for banana. Okay? R stands for what we call rice. A stands for apple, and T stands for toast. Again, banana, rice, apple, and toast. Can you follow? So you call that as your low-fiber diet. So what will you avoid? So when you say low-fiber diet, what are things or what are foods preparations that must be avoided? So if you have low-fiber diet or low-residue diet, you need to avoid what? You need to avoid oily, fried, and dairy products. Can you follow? So if you have low fiber diet, you need to avoid oily foods, you need to avoid fried foods, and dairy preparations. Can you follow? Next, another type of dietary modification is what we call your low purine diet. Can you follow? So when you say low purine diet or purine free diet, this is a type of dietary modification observed to patients with gouty arthritis. Not only for patients with gouty arthritis, but also to patients with what we call renal calculi. Renal calculi in a form of a urate crystal deposition. Now reminder, in your urate crystal deposition or gouty arthritis, it is a form of purine metabolism disorder wherein there is an elevation of the serum uric acid level of the patient. And reminder that uric acid is a byproduct of purine. That is why if you want to decrease the uric acid level, you have to decrease purine intake of the patient. So when you say low purine diet, so what will you avoid? So low purine diet means you need to avoid all boys. You need to avoid all boys. So what does all boys stand for? A, you need to avoid A, anchovies. Anchovies. L, you need to avoid 
lentils. Sorry. L legumes. B beans. Another B beer. O stands for or gan meat. Y you need to avoid yeast. S you need to avoid sprout. And last part of letter S avoid sardines. Can you follow? Avoid sardines. So you need to avoid all boys. A anchovies, L lentils, L legumes, B beans beer, O organ meat, Y yeast, S sprout and S sardines. Can you follow? So that is what we call the low purine diet. Indicated to patient with gout arthritis, renal calculi, what type of renal calculi? A stone made up of urate crystal. And of course, to patients with hyperuricemia or an elevated uric acid level in the blood. Can you follow? So you have your bland diet, low fiber diet, low purine diet. And what else? We also have this one called tyramine free. Where's the eraser? Tyramine free. So when I say tyramine free diet, this is actually indicated to patient receiving a Maui drug or Maui agent. This is also indicated to patient undergoing levodopa treatment or le levodopa therapy and to patient suffering from migraine. Again, tyramine free diet is indicated to patient receiving levodopa. Tyramine free is also indicated to patient receiving Maui, your monoamine oxidase inhibitor drug and to patients suffering from migraine, okay? That is your tyramine-free diet. So when I say tyramine-free diets, what are food preferences that you need to avoid? Well, if it is tyramine-free, please do not forget, okay, you copy this one, you need to avoid the following. Chocolate milk. Chocolate milk. Can you follow? What else? Aside the chocolate milk, you need to avoid red wine. Aside from red wine, what else? You need to avoid processed, or shall I say fermented. Can you follow fermented food? What else? Okay, you need to avoid aged cheese. Question, what about dark chocolates? Can we give dark chocolates? Yes, we can give dark chocolates. Sorry. Sir, what about what about cottage cheese? Can we give cottage cheese? Yes, it's okay to give cottage cheese or even cream cheese can be given to your patient. May be given to your patient. Can you follow? So these are things you need to remember about tyramine free diet. What else? We also have gluten free. Your gluten-free is, ty sorry, your gluten-free diet is indicated for patients with celiac disease. Can you follow? So when you say gluten-free diet, take note, you need to avoid brow. You need to avoid brow. So when you say brow, what will you avoid? You need to avoid barley. You need to avoid, of course, your rye. You need to avoid oats. And you need to avoid what? Of course, your wheat. Can you follow? Now, is it is it is it okay for the patient to eat rice? Is it okay for the patient to eat corn? Answer, yes. Okay to give rice and okay to give corn. Can you follow? So again, gluten-free diet is indicated to patient with celiac disease. Now, what else? There are two more dietary modifications. Acid ash diet, and of course, alkaline ash diet. Okay? Now, when is acid ash diet or alkaline ash diet indicated? 
acid ash diet, the main reason why you have acid ash diet because you want to make the urine acidic. Am I right? So what is the reason why you want to turn the urine acidic? Well, if you have urinary tract infection. So UTI, patient with UTI, best is your acid ash diet because if you turn the urine acidic, it gives you bacteria static effect. What else? Acid ash diet is also indicated to patient with renal, renal calculi. Can you follow? Now what type of renal calculi or kidney stone wherein acid ash diet is indicated or best observed? Well, patient having calcium oxalate or calcium stone. And of course, another, aside from your calcium oxalate, you have your struvites. Or, you also call this as your staghorn stone. Struvite or staghorn stone. Can you follow? So again, calcium oxalate, struvite or staghorn stone, a type of renal calculi you need to observe acid ash diet. Clear? Because you wanted to turn the urine acidic. So how will you turn the urine acidic? I hope you guys remember cranberry juice. Remember, if you drink cranberry juice, it will make the urine acidic. So this is how you're going to make the urine acid, acidic. So you have to observe acid ash diet. Aside from your cranberry juice, if you want to make the urine acidic, you, you, you instruct the patient to eat meat. Can you follow? Instruct the patient to eat dairy products. Can you follow? Or even cheese. Okay, fish, eggs, grains, and fruits, specifically cranberries. But when you talk about alkaline ash diet, this is actually indicated to patient, again, with renal calculi, but of different type of stone. Now, what type of renal calculi or kidney stone where alkaline ash diet is best observed? Answer, patient having urate stone. So, in short, a patient with hyperuricemia, remember, an increase in the serum uric acid level will lead to uric crystal deposition. Am I right? That is why to prevent, okay, to prevent uric stone crystal formation, alkaline ash diet must be observed. Aside from your uric crystals or uric stone formation, another type of renal calculi is your cysteine stone. Cysteine stone. So how will you make the urine alkaline? So what will, you, what will you tell to your patient to encourage alkaline ash diet? Well, if you want to have an alkaline ash diet, you just tell the patient to eat fruits, specifically citrus fruits, except for, take note, all citrus fruits except for cranberry. Can you follow? Aside from cranberry, except, aside from prunes, and aside from plums. Can you follow? So... The rest of citrus fruits or citrus juices may be given as sake except for those three. Again, cranberry, prunes, and plums. Why? Cranberry juice, remember cranberry, prunes, and plums will make the urine acidic. So the rest of the citrus juices may be given to your patient, and those citrus juices will turn the urine alkaline. Okay? I hope you learned some things. Again, we're just a rundown. We mentioned high carbohydrate, low carbohydrate, high protein, low protein, high fat, low fat. Okay, aside from that, we have we mentioned the different specific dietary modifications. You have the bland diet, we mentioned bland diet, we mentioned low fiber or low residue diet, we mentioned tyramine free, gluten free, am I right? We even mentioned acid ash diet and alkaline ash diet. So this is just a very short video clip supplementation of your review notes, the chronicle of medical surgical nursing. Thank you so much and God bless everybody. I hope you learned something. Bye!